So one spring afternoon in 2011, I was in my office with a colleague of mine who also was a Davidson College Wildcat. And we were watching the board chair at Davidson College address students and faculty and many of us who were watching remotely. And as the speaker described the significant merits, and he did go on and on, of the 18th president of Davidson College, he very carefully avoided using any pronouns. And we started to look at each other and say, what if? Finally, he introduced Dr. Carol Quillen, and we were jumping up and down in my office, hugging and cheering. Not long after, I had the pleasure of hearing Carol speak in Charlotte. I left thrilled and encouraged that she had come to lead Davidson College. She was adamant about the fact that a liberal arts education should foster leaders who will disproportionately positively impact their communities. She spoke about the pressing need for inclusivity, truly showing others that they're wanted. I want to tell you about some things that have happened just in the last three weeks. The American Enterprise Institute, a prominent think tank, think tank in Washington, D.C., assembled a very small group of thought leaders in higher education to lead a discussion on saving the liberal arts, moderated by a columnist from the Washington Post. The liberal arts college president they decided to invite was Carol Quillen of Davidson College. A few days later, college and university presidents across North Carolina honored Carol with an award recognizing her leadership in fostering student engagement and community impact. And today, and by that I mean literally she has to leave immediately after speaking, Carol flies to New York as one of the founding college presidents of the American Talent Initiative, which is a rapidly expanding effort funded by former Mayor Michael Bloomberg to enroll 50,000 additional lower income students in our nation's elite colleges and universities by the year 2025. Carol is reimagining what a liberal arts college does, and our nation is taking notice. Davidson students learn how to learn, how to take a problem and reframe it to find a solution, how to work with people who are different, how to confront views they disagree with, and understand how people come to different conclusions. It is my greatest pleasure for this Wildcat to introduce to you the inspiring Dr. Carol Quillen. Thank you so much, Kirsten, and, and thank you all for being here. I, I hope I uh, somehow managed to do justice to those incredibly kind and generous words. I will say that um, one of the things that really pulled me to Davidson was the foundational commitment of that institution, and I actually believe the city, to a kind of honesty. And relentless honesty is hard. Sometimes you see things that aren't pretty, you see things that you don't like, and it's easier to go part way. So in honor of the deep and profound commitment of the YW to a, the difficult task of eliminating racism and empowering women, I'm going to share with you a story about my own attempt to be relentlessly honest with myself and hope that that, in some sense, uh, empowers all of us for the task that, that we face. I didn't know, I'm embarrassed to say, as much about the history of the YW as I should have, either here in Charlotte or nationally and globally. The YW really came into existence in 1858 and fairly soon after that, in the 1890s, the YW nationally made a commitment to serving African American women and indigenous women. Now this commitment to serving women who come from all backgrounds, of all races, and all ethnicities, went beyond simply serving all women 
to include advocating for desegregation and integration. In 1915 and again in 1936, the YW hosted interracial, intercollegiate, co-ed conferences in the South. In the mid-40s, the YW decided that racial injustice was its first cause, and they would work hard to eliminate racial injustice wherever they saw it, in their community, in their country, or in the world. And in 1970, the YW declared that we will thrust all of our collective power towards eliminating racism. 2007, the Stand Against Racism program became signature for the YW, and you heard Kirsten talk so eloquently about everything that this YW does to foster interracial dialogue and to fight against racism every day. This dual mission, eliminating racism and empowering women, really speaks to me. It's profound, it's important, and it honors the legacy of our country. In some sense, this dual mission holds up for all of us to see the promise of the United States of America that all people are created equal, that freedom is an inalienable right, and that we won't be who we claim to be until we honor that for everyone. For me, a powerful expression of this ideal comes from a poem by Maya Angelou, which if you've been watching the Olympics may be familiar to you, as I think it's in about five different commercials. So I apologize for the commercialization of this poem, but, but it really speaks powerfully to me, and it's called The Human Family. And I, I hope you'll allow me to read from it. I note the obvious differences in the human family. Some of us are serious, some thrive on comedy. Some declare their lives are lived as true profundity, and others claim they really live the real reality. The variety of our skin tones can confuse, bemuse, delight. Brown and pink and beige and purple, tan and blue and white. I've sailed the seven seas and stopped in every land. I've seen the wonders of the world, not yet one common man. I know 10,000 women called Jane and Mary Jane, but I've not seen any two who really were the same. Mara twins are different, although their features jive, and lovers think quite different thoughts when lying side by side. We love and lose in China, we weep on England's moors, and laugh and moan in Guinea, and thrive on Spanish shores. We seek success in Finland, are born and die in Maine. In minor ways we differ, in major we are the same. I note the obvious differences between each sort and type, but we are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. We are more alike, my friends, than we are unalike. Now, Maya Angelou repeats that at the end of her poem over and over and over again. Do we get it yet? We are more alike than unalike. She, if you've ever heard her read it, she slows down. This is the promise of our country, that we share a common humanity that we all must honor. It is, the, for many of us, an imperative not only of our nation and our politics, but of our faith. So why, why is it so hard? Why is it taking so long? What about this is so difficult? The first interracial conference advocating for the full participation in American life by all of our citizens in the 40s, it's 2018, why so hard? Confronting this question means thinking about how we tell stories. In calm, in the abstract, we all agree. Maya Angelou can speak for all of us. 
but when we're afraid, or when we're hurt, or when we're angry, or when we're threatened, like the current political climate, then we forget. And the stories we tell about ourselves and other people no longer reflect what we believe. Chimimanda Ngozi Adichie says this, show a people as one thing over and over and over again, and they become that thing. I want to tell a little bit of a story about my, my experience with this storytelling. And it's, it's hard for me to tell because I'm not, I'm not proud of this. And I share it with you, not because it's a pleasant story, because it isn't, but because I think it points to the challenge we have of simultaneously striving to eliminate racism and empowering women. Often those things go together, but when they don't, they don't. And that is why I think this has been so hard for us to achieve. In the spring of 1989, I was at Princeton, finishing graduate school, getting ready to move to Houston where I would be teaching really for the first time. I was so excited and one of the classes that I was going to be able to teach was women's history, about which I knew very little. Now, the reason why they asked me to teach women's history at Rice, I believe, is because I was a woman, not recognizing that that didn't actually qualify me to teach women's history. <laughs> So I was doing a lot of reading about women's history and learning a lot and discovering a lot, a lot of new heroes. And I was really reading for the first time about the relationship between the abolitionist movement and the suffragist movement in this country. I had known a little bit about it, but not a lot. And as I read about this, these suffragists who had fought so hard for everything that I took completely for granted, I was finding new heroes. And I recognized that my ability to be at Princeton, my ability to get a job, my ability to imagine being a college professor, my ability to imagine working and having a child, all of these things were the, were the result of the advocacy of these women who were fighting so hard to get women the vote. And these women were also largely abolitionists. They recognized the horrific injustice and immorality of slavery. And I'm going to read you one passage, which is from Elizabeth Cady Stanton, so you can get the, the depth of her conviction that slavery was wrong. It was thought a small matter, she said, to kidnap one black man in Africa and set him to work in the rice swamps of Georgia. But when we look at the panorama of horrors that followed that event, at all the statutes that were enacted to make that horrible act legal, at the perversion of man's moral sense and innate love of justice in being compelled to defend such laws, when we consider the long, hard tussle we have witnessed here for nearly a century between the spirit of liberty and slavery, we may, in some small measure, appreciate the magnitude of the wrong done to that one lone friendless man who under the cover of darkness and the star-spangled banner was stolen from his native Africa and lodged in the hold of the American slaver. Now I read this so you can see her, her conviction that slavery was wrong was real and as I in 1989 was reading these stories I thought wow there's a whole new kind of hero out there for me. There's Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Angelina and Sarah Grimke from South Carolina and Harriet Jacobs from North Carolina, these women who fought so hard to make my life possible. And while this is happening in April of 1989, on April 19th, in fact, in fact, an event happened that shook a little bit how I was thinking. This was the day that a young woman whose name was not known to us for many, many years, left her job at Solomon Brothers to go jogging in Central Park at about 9 p.m. She left her job to go jogging, and shortly after she entered the park, she was beaten very, very badly and left for dead. She was sexually assaulted. She lost 80% of the blood in her body, and everyone thought she was going to die. Miraculously, she did not. She recovered, though she still has some symptoms. 
and she's now a victim's rights advocate and speaker. Now this case in New York caused such furor that a week later, five boys, boys of color, black and brown boys, were arrested and convicted fairly quickly of this crime. Donald Trump, now President Trump, took out full page ads in all the New York dailies calling for the reinstatement of the death penalty. These boys were between the ages of 14 and 16. We know now the five boys convicted of this crime did not commit the crime because another man confessed 13 years after they were convicted. Now I tell this story because everything around me at that moment in 1989 was telling me to identify with this woman. She was uh, just as she was white. She had all her life before. She had the privilege of an Ivy League education. She'd gone to Yale and Wellesley. She worked at Solomon Brothers. Her whole life was before her. She was a jogger. I was a jogger. We were the women that were going to make women powerful in this country. We were going to take our place. And the way this story unfolded in the news, that understanding, my identification with her, went along with dehumanizing five black and brown children. These boys were called savages and beasts and wolves, and they were railroaded. So I tell this story because that was in the moment where I realized my empowerment, my fighting for my own right to job, to work, to have a kid, that that could, didn't have to, but it could come at the expense of people who were my natural allies. And what made that possible for me in 1989, for New York in 1989, for the country in 1989, was the historical imagination that we brought to that. These ready images that we redeploy and redeploy and redeploy in moments of fear that allow us to dehumanize whole categories of people because it's convenient in the moment. And women like me are not immune from that. I did that, I'm embarrassed to say, in 1989. And so when we talk about the importance of eliminating racism and empowering women, people like me, white women like me, need to recognize how we have in the past, at times, staked our own empowerment on the oppression of other people, equally excluded from the promise of this country. Dehumanizing characterizations have a long history in our country. Our lawmakers use them to justify slavery and Jim Crow. Vigilantes use them to justify lynching. And these racist stories, historically and now, have become the story that we deploy when we ourselves are scared. Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who so powerfully understood the immorality of slavery, she did this. So why do I tell you this? This is not a happy time. Why do I bring this to this group of people, this ballroom full of people who are committed to the dual goal of eliminating racism and empowering women? I tell it so that you will activate in yourself your powerful capacity, which you've demonstrated over and over again, which is demonstrated in the work of the YWCA, YWCA over and over again, to listen and hear other stories, to resist what fear and our history sometimes tell us to do, to pull back and listen for the stories not yet told. In the Central Park jogger case that I mentioned, there were lots of women in New York, brave women who stood there with signs that said, feminists against racism. Not my empowerment at the expense of someone else. They pointed out that in the same week that this woman was so badly beaten, 28 other women had suffered a similar fate with no attention at all paid to them. They pointed out that dehumanizing the accused did not empower the victim. They pointed to other stories that were not being told. I think this is so important now 
at this time of isolation and polarization where our country is so divided that we listen for the stories that don't have the platform that I have before you today, that we listen for stories that are hiding in, this, in the interstices of stories we already know. Last night here in Charlotte, Mayor Lyle suggested that inclusive communities can only be shaped when you know your history and deal with it up front and forthrightly. The past is with us. It shapes our imagination. In our fight to eliminate racism and empower women, the past dwells in our nation and can interfere with that task. I'm so proud, so proud and humbled to be here with you who resist this, to be here with you who hold out the hope that eliminating racism can empower women, that eliminating racism and empowering women together will finally help our country live up to the promise of its founding. I want to close with a quote from one of my favorite, favorite speakers. And I am always reluctant to quote her because I can't do her justice. And that's Barbara Jordan. Barbara Jordan said in 1976 in her speech before the Democratic National Convention, many fear the future. Many are distrustful of their leaders and believe that their voices are never heard. Many seek only to satisfy their private work and wants, to satisfy their private interests. But this is the great danger America faces, that we will cease to be one nation and become instead a collection of interest groups, city against suburb, region against region, individual against individual, each seeking to satisfy private wants. If that happens, who then will speak for America? Who then will speak for the common good? Can we remember Barbara Jordan's words with hope and promise and joy? Can we, like the amazing people at the YW, get proximate to those who are different so that attempts to crush their stories and silence their pain is not permitted? Can we, together, call on our city and our country at last to live up to the great promise of our founding? Thank you very much.